everyone. Uh, my name is Amy Foote and I am our MESA, our Math Engineering Science Achievement Program Director. And I would like to welcome all of you here uh, for our MESA speakers presentation this evening with Mr. Riza Rasul speaking about vortex theory. Uh, Let's welcome Riza. <laughs> thank you everybody, thanks for coming uh, to the lecture, thanks for the kind introduction, I'd like to thank Dr. Moose for uh, the kind words he said and um, thank Professor Amy Foote. For... So this is actually the second in a series of lectures on fundamental physics, the first one was before we went into lockdown 2019 and we said we were going to do it annually and the campus was locked down and so we never got around to it. So what do we uncover today? I'm going to briefly recap what the trouble with physics is, not psychics. We'll talk about the hypothesis that the theory of nothing we are asked to believe at the moment with our current mainstream theory is at fault and that is an impediment to coming up with a theory of everything. So the, the hypothesis that we're bringing to, to the table is that there is a, a fluidic ether that is a better description of the medium of reality, better than space-time. We'll talk about what its properties are, how it manifests the forces of nature, how particles arise from it, and perhaps we can gain a better insight into what is mass and what is time. So any theory needs to be able to make predictions so that you can prove or disprove it. If, uh, if you're not making predictions, then it's not science, it's religion. So I'd also want to end by a call to action and figure out how you can participate. Before I proceed, I'd like to know who's in the audience. Um, so hands up, who are the STEM majors? Okay, great, you're clustered over there. Hands up, who are the humanities majors? Okay, the humanities seem to be all on the, the upper end over here, the north campus. This is like UCLA, it's the north-south campus divided. Did you, did you deliberately set it up like that? What I thought was that there's something that poets and physicists have in common. They try and take very complex ideas and compress it and encapsulate it into a simple um, formulation that can be maybe put on a coffee cup or could be written um, on a t-shirt. So I thought I'd take a stab at that and encapsulate the entire theory of nothing in a haiku, which has uh, got a very rigid structure. It's a, what's it, it's a five, seven, five syllable structure. And of course, this makes no sense to you now. Um, I want to make apologies to uh, uh, Yates and Carol. I see one of Carol's descendants in the background, in, in the back row there. So apologies to your people. Um, but uh, hopefully, at the end of this lecture, I'm going to have this bring up this slide again, and this haiku is going to make much more sense. So, what is wrong with physics? And what is wrong with the accepted model that we have today? The thing that's called the standard model. I don't have to enumerate the problems. There's a great book written, The Trouble with Physics, and it's written by a, a character called Lee Smolin. And he lists five major points of crisis in the current established mainstream theory. And in fact, it's not a single theory, it's a collection of theories. They call it the standard model. Part of our understanding of the world um, is described by Albert Einstein's relativity, both special and general relativity. And then another part of reality is described by quantum mechanics. And the problem is the two don't marry up. They, they're inconsistent with each other. And uh, we don't have a single theory of everything that unifies the forces and particles. Instead, we have a collection of fields that permeate all of space that are tuned by fudge factors that are not derived from theory, but have to be figured out from experiment. 
And then we've got some big problems at the cosmological scale. We're seeing that the universe, in fact space itself, right here, is expanding in a way that we don't understand, and that's called dark energy. Similarly, when we look out at galaxies, we see galaxies rotating much faster than they should be for the amount of mass that we can see, the amount of visible mass that is shining. So um, astronomers are on the search for dark matter. Whenever the theorists say dark, they mean they can't explain it. And it signifies a failure of theory. So we want to um, see if we can come up with a theory that can help us probe those things that are not understood um, at the moment. So what's impeding? Why, why is this not being solved? What is the, the systemic block? Well, the second half of Lee Smolin's book was all about the systemic impediments to fixing the crisis in physics. When I reflect on it, I reflect on how I was educated and what the problems are in education itself and where better to criticise education than at a college. We teach students to learn but not to think. We, we drill them with facts but they're not taught to ask why. In fact, the current hegemonic belief system of physics tells you you're not allowed to ask why. There's certain things that are unknowable and then they give them names like the uncertainty principle or the incompleteness theory or cracks in the pavement that you're not allowed to step on. But why? Because, because I said so. And that sort of teaching really rubbed me up the wrong way um, from when I was a little child, from when the imams would tell me, recite. What did recite mean? It meant decode Arabic letters only as much as you could utter their sounds. You don't need to know what, it, what the words mean. I heard that same sort of sentiment when I was studying physics. And there's a quote maybe misattributed to Richard Feynman where he says, shut up and calculate. There's, there's a big branch of physics where you have to do quite onerous, tedious computations in order to figure out an answer, but there's no theory behind why you're doing those calculations. That is the Feynman path integral. It's at the heart of quantum mechanics. So it appears to me that this sort of dynamic repeats itself in many domains where language is a way of maintaining the jobs, maintaining the power of a high priest class, of a clergy, whether the language is Latin, maintaining the clergy of Catholicism, um, whether it's Arabic, maintaining um, uh, a control over Islam, um, hieroglyphics, mathematics in itself, of unnecessarily obfuscated mathematics, maintains this high priest class of physics and makes it inaccessible to the lay person. So even if you wanted to ask why, you're prevented from doing that. You can tell from where I'm coming from that I'm a bit of a, an outsider and a critic, but um, let me reflect a bit on how I became a physicist, somewhat of a reluctant physicist, a failed medical student interview. My mum wanted me to be a doctor. I would have been a poor doctor. But I accidentally enrolled in physics and maybe over a, some socialisation, maybe a drink, I'll tell you about how um, Stephen Hawking could be credited for getting my degree bumped up a grade. This image was on the wall of the lab and you can see there it's signed Franklin. It was the experimental data that was acquired by Rosalind Franklin. She acquired the essential data that would prove the structure of DNA. But she was a woman, she had no power in that infrastructure. Even though she was the head of department, 
that the males in their department simply just didn't recognize her authority. And over one weekend, they loaned her data to Watson and Crick, who spent the weekend just guessing randomly at what the structure could be. They went and published a paper, and they end up getting the Nobel Prize, and she gets no credit for it. In her lab was Alex Stokes. He was a junior uh, postdoc. He ended up being my professor, and so the class of 1984 was his last class, was his last uh, year at uh, King's College, and he, um, he retired after that. But some, of, some famous alums, James Clark Maxwell, who you'll hear about later on, and then the new rock star of, um, of physics is Peter Higgs, alum of King's College. Um, let's see. Thank you very much, Floyd, for, for enumerating my, uh, my, my activities, my day job. But in my spare time, I'm a curious, critical thinker. Father to four boys, they're all here. No, they're not all here, but three out of four is not bad. I think, uh, you, I think you can get a degree on three out of four, pretty good degree. Uh, husband to Professor Ruth Rasul, hiding in the back. <laughs> and um, I descend from a long line of troublemakers and critical thinkers from South Africa. You see my dad there, English schoolmaster. Hey, we're wearing the same jacket. <laughs> This is how he would go to work every day, suit and tie. I think that's uh, what, when I think of a teacher, that's what I think of. So let's make some trouble. <laughs>